I wanted to tease you a little bit today um, with a story that I wanted to introduce that I'm not going to pick up until I get back. <laughs> In fact, I probably won't even pick it up until January, so you'll kind of have to sit on it for a little while, which is a good thing. It's a little book. Uh, Yogi Berra told me to get this book. You know who Yogi Berra is, right? <laughs> Yogi Berra. And this was after I, I got through preaching on the, the 23rd Psalm. Any of you were here for that series? Philip Carroll Keller is the one we followed along in his book. Uh, and, uh, but Philip, who's, who's gone to be with the Lord, he's not on this side anymore, uh, he wrote another little book. And this little book is called Lessons from a Sheepdog. And so I picked this book up this week and just went, wow, wow, this is good stuff. This is really good stuff. Stuff that I need to hear and stuff that you need to hear. So I wanted to use Philip's uh, material to just tell you a little story, introduce Philip and his situation uh, with his sheepdog uh, this morning. Um, did your parents tell you any stories when you were growing up? Did, did they ever like sit you on their lap when you were little, tell you a good story? Did you like that? Um, not everybody had that opportunity. Sometimes parents didn't do it and grandparents did and sometimes people didn't have that opportunity at all and, and they missed something that can be very special when your parents sit you on the lap when you're little and tell you a little story. And of course, with our boys, their favorite story was Go Dog Go. <laughs> you love that story. But we didn't just read secular books to them. We also told them the stories of the Bible uh, when they were little. We told them about David and Goliath. Boy, they loved that story. And and I had to be careful because they would want to act out the stories that we would tell them. And I said, we can't, you know, hit your, you can't hit your brother with the rocks, you know. And Samson, we told that story ad nauseum, and, uh, and they knew from when they were little not to marry a bad lady <laughs> like Delilah. And then we would tell them the story. I think we told the story of Joseph more than any other story. And to this day, the boys debate with each other who's going to get the coat of many colors. <laughs> they loved a good story, and we love telling them. And uh, when you're a preacher, you're, you're kind of a little storyteller, and a story can really resonate with us. In fact, Philip, in this little book that he wrote, he said that God used a little dog to teach him some lessons in his life that a sermon could have never given him. Does anybody in here have a border collie? Anybody have a border collie? Yes? Got a border collie? Got one? Got half of one? <laughs> According to Philip, the best sheep dog there is is a full blood border collie. They are the top of the line. Well, Philip, he um, was up as a young man in his 20s in British Victoria. And he was working on a ranch and had worked his way up on a very large ranch of cows. And so that's all he really knew was cows. And he thought that was the direction that he was going to go in. And he found a piece of property in British, British Victoria that was at the end of the road um, on the seashore. And it had uh, really become a derelict piece of property. And so that made it cheap. And so he bought this piece of property with the intention of turning it into a ranch for cows. However, when he bought the property, he was out of money. And so he didn't have the money to buy cows, and he said, well, I've got to start somewhere. So he went and bought some sheep. 
and he had never uh, owned sheep. He had never worked with sheep before, but he went ahead and bought some on his limited budget to try to turn this piece of property around with the intentions of someday um, buying some cattle and, and, and doing the ranch that way. Well, when he bought these sheep, he learned um, quickly uh, that, boy, they are so much more difficult than cows. In fact, he really second-guessed himself, and he said, why did I do that? These sheep are so dumb and vulnerable, and they need so much care, and you have to watch out for them as we went through the story of Psalm 23. We all remember those many things that he taught us about the shepherd and the sheep. And so he realized, and he had brought his cow dog with him. And he thought, well, I'll just use my cow dog with the sheep. Not happening. The cow dog wouldn't have anything to do with the sheep. So he thought, I've got to get some help. I need a sheep dog. I can't do this all on my own in this limited budget. And so he began to look through the want ads for a dog. And uh, as he did, he found a dog by the name of Lassie. Now, he's going to call this dog Lass, but here's what the ad in the paper said. Wanted a good country home for a purebred border collie, chases cars and bicycles. So he called the lady on the ad, do you still have the dog? She said, yes. She said, but I, I still have the dog, but please come quickly. No one else wants her. And her voice sounded desperate. Well, Mr. Keller, I can't do it. He finally arrives. He says, Mr. Keller, I can't do She said, I can't do a thing with this creature. This dog is plumb crazy. She's loco. The woman threw up her hands in dismay. All she does is tear after the kids, chase boys on bicycles, jumps all the fences, and races after every car that comes by on the road. Well, Philip said, well, could I see her? And so she took him into the backyard, and he looked at Lassie, and when he saw her and he walked towards her, she just leaped towards him and snarled and snapped and then collapsed on a heap on the ground. And she was chained uh, with a, she had a iron collar around her neck that was chaining her to a post in the ground. And then she had another chain around her neck that was tied to her back foot. Instantly, uh, into his shock and his horror, he sold that. He asked her, he said, how old is she? And she said, she's about two years old. He said, normally when a dog gets that old, it's kind of tough to teach them new things. But Philip looked at this dog. He said, this dog, the master breeders did a wonderful job in developing this dog. This dog had a constitution about her. He said she had massive shoulders and she had such strong legs. And Philip said to himself, I just believe that I can do something with this dog. But he told her, he said, I don't know, ma'am. He said, I'm going to try my best. He said, but if I can't teach her, he said, I'm going to have to bring her back in six weeks, and you're going to have to destroy her. You'll have to agree to that. And so the lady said, sure, you know, because she didn't know what else to do. So he took Lass home and had her in the back seat and was just talking to her on the way home and trying to reassure home. She's just snapping. She's just growling. He gets her home. He gives her a clean bed to lie on, a big bowl of fresh food, and a bowl of clean water to drink. Lass won't have a thing to do with it. 
won't touch it day after day after day. He would try to go and just nudge up to her with her hand. He, she would just growl at him, mad, angry, would resist him, afraid. This went on so long that Philip thought to himself, Nana, she's going to die. She didn't drink or eat. So he decided to do something, the unthinkable. He took her leash off and let her go free. She took off like a rocket, disappeared. Where'd she go? He didn't know. First day went by, second day went by, third day went by. He went and checked with all the neighbors. He's driving around everywhere, looking through the woods. Can't find her. Until finally, one evening, he looked up, and up on the ridge, he had like a, <clears throat> a, a big boulder up there, a rock ledge. And he, remember, where he, where he lived, um, the, it was by the seashore, so he had a lot of seashore on us property, a lot of beach, and you could, you could get on this ledge, and you could look out, and you could see the sea and all of that, and he looked up there, and there was Lass. And so he went up there, and he took her food and her water there. Of course, she left as soon as he got there, but it, when he went back the next day, she had eaten it, and she had drank the water. So he did that day after day after day for a time. And he thought, well, I... I don't know. And then one day, and then, and then what he started doing is he started bringing some of his sheep by that rock ledge and uh, for her to see the sheep because what was that, what was last designed for? Why did God bring a lass into this world? Boy, he had a special plan for lass. He had a special project for her. He had something designed just for her. And he noticed after several days of bringing his sheep around where Lass could see him that she stood up and she kind of cocked her face a little bit and she lifted her leg up and she was studying them like, hey, I, maybe I'm supposed to be a part of this. So several days went on. I forgot how long it was and he kept doing this. And he thought, I don't know. In fact, uh, several weeks had gone by by this point, and it was coming close to the six weeks. And what he was doing, I'll have to demonstrate for you, is he said there was one particular evening, and he said the sun was going down. It was a beautiful sunset over the water, and uh, his sheep were, were doing well, even though it was so hard, so much hard work for himself, doing this all by himself. He said, but it was a beautiful evening. It was nice and cool, and I just was admiring my sheep and how well they were doing. And, and Philip said he stood there, and he put his hands behind himself like this as he was looking at the sheep and just basking in the moment. And all of a sudden, he felt something on the back of his hand. And it was the nose of Lass. And he turned around, and there she was. And she didn't run away. At that juncture, Lass and Philip became more than master and servant. Oh, Boy, a love relationship developed, and they became friends. So, well, for last to fulfill this destiny that God designed for her life, she was going to need Philip to instruct her, to teach her. And so he started teaching her voice commands. Go here, go there, do this, do that. 
And boy, she was just, she, he said she was so intelligent. She picked up on all this stuff immediately. Didn't hardly take any time at all. Well, once you get through the voice commands, then you've got to do something else with your dog. You've got to teach your dog signals when they're far away and they can't hear you. You've got to give them hand signals. And so, like, go left or go right when the dog's way out there. I was so excited when I was reading that this week. I said, Hudson, let's go outside and try this in the front yard. I said, Hudson, go left. And he went, whoa. Hudson, come back. We've done a terrible job with Hudson. And it even gets worse when he came back. I gave him a treat. <laughs> terrible. One problem Lass had, as good as she was doing, as wonderful as she was doing, she had one big problem. He said, she became so devoted to me. She became my shadow. She lived to serve me. She became all mine, Philip said. Her entire life was about serving me, was about obeying me, was about doing whatever I wanted her to do. But she had one problem. Because she wanted to be so close to me and wanted to see me, when I told her to go do something and I had to go do something else, it was difficult for her to do it because she didn't want to get away from me. And then I had to send her into places where I was, why she couldn't see me. And she had to do what they call a blind leap of faith. She had to trust me. She had to go out there and do the job that I wanted her to do, that I instructed her to do, even though she couldn't physically see me. And it was so difficult for her to do that, to get away from my presence. Boy, there's so many parallels here, isn't there? My mind was just reeling as I was listening to all this. I thought about that one ad. <laughs> you remember what the lady said, the former owner? She told Mr. Keller, nobody else wants her. Because she's no good. You see, all she does is chase cars and bicycles. She's not doing what she was designed to do in the first place. She has discarded all of her potential. What does the Bible say in Ephesians chapter 1? That God adopted us into his family. You weren't born into his family. You were adopted, and sometimes, when a child is adopted, it's because nobody else wants that child. And you know what God is saying? Nobody else may want you, but I want you. In Ephesians chapter 1, it says that God chose us before the foundation of the world. And you know, when God chose us, when God adopted us, we were chained to that post. We were slaves to sin. We were not doing what we had been designed to do, but God saw past that. He saw our constitution. He saw those broad shoulders, those strong legs. He saw that opportunity, and he said, I believe I can redeem that child. I want them in my family. And then once we come into that family, then Jesus, as he said to disciples on the seashore, in Capernaum says, follow me. He gives a command. He gives a voice command. He says, follow me. And we're doing so well. Remember when you first got saved? Man, everything was so wonderful. Everybody was glad to see you at church. Remember those days? <laughs> and then some, oh gosh, here comes, oh, here we go. No, 
<laughs> but it was so exciting, wasn't it? And you, you it's, it's like you and God, you are his shadow. And you could hear his voice, and boy, when the preacher preached, you didn't fall asleep. Man, you were into it. You're like, this, he's speaking to me. This is so exciting. It's so fun. But as time wore on, as you got further away from that day that you became a believer, something changed. Oh, I don't hear God's voice like I used to. It's not the same when I was a brand new Christian and everything was brand new and, and I've gone through some trouble and some heartache and some loss and this happened and that happened and, and I don't understand that and I don't understand that and where is God? And what was the Lord doing all the time saying, will you trust me only when you can see me? Or even when I give you a command to go around the corner and you have to trust me, a blind trust so many parallels no last man her her whole life was about serving her master she loved Philip and you know something Philip spoke about how he loved Lass they developed such a bond and such a friendship. One little thing, we're getting ready to close here. Um, one other little problem Lass had is um, the crows would come down and try to antagonize uh, Lass. They'd fly down, and it just bugged her. And she got distracted and would try to jump up and snap them and, and chase after them. Well, he, you know, Philip said it was a beautiful thing to watch. It was lots of fun, but it didn't do me any good or the sheep. And then one other thing happened. They would have to burn some of the land in the wintertime uh, to recultivate that. And so the fire would cause these embers to go up in the air. And, oh, that just, that just fascinated last to no end and she would jump up to try to go get those things and chase after them and every once in a while one of them would land in her hair and just burn her and then she after she did all that just prancing around jumping around she would come back she would come back to philip and say wasn't that wonderful <laughs> and philip said but after i disciplined her because she was designed for a purpose and not to stray off and not to be distracted. I would caress her and I would hold her in my arms and I would say, it's okay, Lass. I love you. And Lass would jump out of his arms and make a circle all around him and then jump back into his arms because reconciliation had transpired. Just a little story I thought you'd be interested in. And we're going to pick it up probably in January. <laughs> so hold on. Let's pray. You see, last in those early days was afraid to come to her new master. Thank God, Lass got a new master. You see, that's what every person needs on this planet before they come to know the Lord. You see, the old master has you tied in chains to a post, and he will never let you be what God had designed for you to be. No, we need to be released and the only one who can set us free is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not the one you want to resist. He's the one you want to come. Jesus said in Matthew 11, come to me. Is there anyone here today who needs to come to the Lord for the very first time? to trust him as Lord and Savior, to be set free from those chains of slavery. 
Is there anybody? Just stand up and come forward as we're praying. The rest of us are praying about following the Lord's commands, whether we can see him, whether we can hear him or not see him or not hear him. But to blindly trust him, the rest of us are praying about that master plan that God has for each of us.